in Australia really? a little bit. So this is called 50 plus actually 75 hyper engaging activities, critical, creative, cooperative. And these slides have been posted. They're printed out in a color PDF and they've been posted in the MOOC. If you want the originals, send me a note. Um, but the color PDFs are up. They're also in my Facebook account. Some of you are my Facebook friends. Again, low risk, low cost, low time. Small baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. You know, we don't want to go too far along. Just think about low risk, low cost, low time. And again, in the book that some of you will, will get uh, as an, a prize, we've got a whole chart in here on what are low risk, low cost, low time activities, and it actually says that in there, low risk, low cost, low time, right there on the camera, you see. So, and again, if you weren't here in week one, we've posted three chapters from my motivation book up there that I've yet to publish, and, and, and you'll get 30 activities, low risk, low cost, low time. Now, some people like Cindy and Aziz and Mark in Dubai, they're going to go for high risk, high cost, high time activities. I know these people very well. They're on the bleeding edge of everything. Other people that you're going to be training in your respective places might try the, the lower risk. So think about these activities again from the degree of time, risk, and cost. So, and, and maybe write down ideas you will use, ideas you might use, and ideas you won't use bad ideas. We're going to start with some simple things. You know, again, you got to be a pirate and steal ideas. So, you know, um, we'll call myself Blackboard the Pirate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, Blackboard the Pirate. There we go. So, um, so you know, you got you to gotta share ideas anyhow. And, and so we're doing that here. We're trying to share some ideas with you. I'm not expecting you to use more than four or five over the whole five weeks that we're here. If you use four or five, I think your courses will be changed a little bit. So who's falling asleep so far, yes or no? <laughs> Some of you are putting your sunglasses and you're zoning out already, you know, and you just, you know, but uh, hopefully, hopefully, you know, let's wake people up here a little bit. Um, 25% of you are sleeping. Okay, okay. What can we do about the 25% out there? <laughs> All right. Some honesty in the group here. All right. Let's go. Some warm up activities online. Some social activities online. Little known facts. How about people posting in the Blackboard forum or if you're using Desire to Learn or Moodle or whatever you're using, post some little known facts as a way to introduce yourself and then have a sheet of, uh, of paper if you meet face to face where people complete little known facts about their peers, get to know their peers. If you're online, have a, a place to go to comment on these little known facts. Point out what you have in common with each other. Or do some have you ever's. Have you ever been to Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of Saud? Have you ever been to Dubai and, and rode a donkey or something? Have you ever been to you know, to Geelong and seen the Geelong Cats in their Australian rules rugby team? Have you ever seen Australian rules rugby. Ask these questions and put them in the icebreaker activity so students can respond to one another. Have you been to Iceland like one of our guests here have today? She lived in Iceland, of course. Accomplishments. What have you accomplished in your life other than attending the MOOC? What have you attended? What have you done? Have you ran a marathon? Have you um, made it through your master's degree? What have you accomplished in your life? And if you're doing it online, you can have people comment on what they have in common with each other. If you're doing it in a face-to-face -face class, you can write all their names down on a sheet of paper with blank spaces and have students walk around the room to get signatures next to different accomplishments. Eight nouns activity I mentioned two weeks ago. You know, I can say, you know, I like smiley men, but uh, I'm a pirate. You know, I already said I'm a pirate. I'm a music lover. I'm a traveler. I, you know. I start explaining things about myself that then people find out a little bit about who I am by posting my eight nouns or eight verbs and you can comment on each other. These are just warm up activities. Icebreaker number five, expectations and goals. What are your goals in this class? I have to wipe the machine off here as I 
<laughs> my, my tea is splattering all over my screen. Mm. Anyhow, what are your goals? What do your students want to accomplish? Not what do you as an instructor want to accomplish. What do they want to accomplish? And what do they have in common? You can then point out, we'll get to that in week four. We'll get to that in week five. And, and maybe, maybe we'll get to it in week seven. But their tension will go down if they know that Cindy's going to get to it in week 10, or Aziz is going to get to it in week 15, you know, or Greg, or whomever, or Terry Anderson, the other Terry Anderson. We'll get to it. So this is a way to find out what students want to know. And you can then get at how we will learn this stuff. You can also create coffee houses. Now, in this week or past week in the MOOC, a lot of people have been asking, how do I build a coffee house? How do I build a cafe in Blackboard or in Desire to Learn? What do I do? If you go back to week one and download the free article I posted um, on chapter three of my book, it explains how to create a cafe and how to variations in the cafe. But basically, it's a discussion thread that you set up for social interaction. Scavenger hunts, having students find things on the web that they might use later in the course. So you might test their passwords. You might see if they can access a website and use it. So having them find pieces of information. Now, I've heard that scavenger hunts aren't as popular in Asia as they are here in the United States. So this might be an activity that's specific to a culture like in North America. I'm not sure, Myung, if it will work well in Korea, if people will know what this is. Do, have you used this in uh, have people in Asia and, and Europe? Have, have you used this activity? I, I don't know. Warm-up ca warm cases. You can have a scenario or a case problem or is some kind of situation that students read about or they watch a video and they discuss before coming to a face-to-face -face class or before a synchronous experience like this as a warm-up activity to get them started. So mm, you might have them go through a special issue of a, of a journal and read about the digital campus today. And they might read different articles in it. And then they discuss, you know, that, that idea. And, you know, as Tom says, very popular in, in, in military education to have case warm-up activities. And then you might flip it when you meet face-to-face -face and give them the opposite case. Give them something else that they hadn't thought about and have them read that as a counter case. So this is a way to get ideas going. Just-in-time syllabus, to have the skeleton or the pieces of a syllabus that you put together for your class and then change it as new things come up in the news, as new um, innovations happen, as new discoveries happen, or popular topics, you know, or, or, or maybe a conference that you can have your students attend that's virtual. So a just-in-time syllabus has the shell or the pieces of a syllabus that you fill in, especially in economics classes, in business classes, maybe even military classes like Major Tom's, you know, where new things happen around the world that you can add to. So a just-in-time syllabus, just-in-time teaching was created here in Indiana by a physics professor named Gregor Novak, who now works at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, I believe, Colorado. He created just-in-time teaching, or J-I-T-T. If you go to the web and type in J-I-I-T, and maybe Justin can type in the URL for that, J-I-I-T, um, there are a whole group of people, not just physics professors, not just physics high school teachers, but also there are Photography instructors, chemistry, biology, doing just-in-time teaching, warm-up activities online to get your students into an activity. What Greg R. Novak would do is give his students a quiz, a test, on Wednesday morning, like today. In, in, in Korea, it's Thursday morning. I'm sorry. In Australia, it's Thursday morning. I know uh, Leanne. 
Uh, but, you know, in, in the U.S. it's still Wednesday. So he would give people a Wednesday quiz. And then on Wednesday night, he would change his whole class based on the morning quiz. It's called just-in-time teaching. So changing your class, you know, like a going back in time, a time machine, yeah. Who said that? Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for these side comments, Mitch. Thanks for playing along for this, Mitch. So those are some 10 warm-up activities. Five of those I've got listed here. So poll number 12, which of these warm-up activities did you like best? Have you ever? Accomplishment hunt, goals and expectations, scavenger hunt, or just-in-time teaching, or just-in-time syllabus, or just-in-time leaving? Goodbye. Oh, I'm back. No, I'm not. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> oh, smile with me, smile with me, smile with me. All right, how are we doing on the results here so far? People like just-in-time stuff. They like the um, goals and expectations. You know, I use the goals and expectations idea, and I also use commitments. I have my students post commitments. What are they going to do in my class? Um, what, will they, what do they want to accomplish in my class? It's especially helpful with returning adult students. If I get them to commit to something, they're less likely to drop my class because they've posted it in Blackboard. They posted it in Sakai or Moodle. They posted what it is they're committing to. And this way, their peers have read it. If, if Greg's peers have read what he's going to do, if, if um, Alejandro and uh, Alexander and Anne and April and Barbara and Betty and Bruna and Cynthia and Debbie and Dorit and Irene and Jeffrey and I'm reading everyone's name here. Leanne and Maria and Mark and um, Paul and Paul and Paul and Peggy. If you know if if, if you're committing to something rich, and we got a number of rich and Ruth and Sandra and Serena and Stephen and Sue and Susan and Tim, if you're committing to something in my class, Zachary, and you uh, you'll more likely stay in my class if you in your response to students, include their names, they're less likely to drop your class because you've provided them with some social respect in a way. And so commitments. Um, let's go to a yes, no poll here, Haviz, real quick. Um, how many of you think you might use commitments in your class? I didn't have commitments as one of the 10 warm-up activities. How many of you think commitments might be a good idea? And if not, it's OK. Interesting results. We've got 267 people with us, and the majority of people think they could use commitments. So commitments, goals, and expectations. And lo and behold, those are the two warm-up activities I use almost every semester. I like the eight nouns activity, and I sometimes use just-in-time teaching. But um, yeah, a lot of people are using that. Great. Good to have you with us on that one. Let's go to part two. 25, oh, we got a question coming in from Justin. Justin. Come join us and read the question. Put the headset on, Justin, and, and read the question for everyone. Let's involve Justin. Put the headset on. There you go. Hello. Yeah, this is summarized from the chat, but um, a couple of people are asking about do students get frustrated at syllabuses that change? You know, so if you're doing a JITT syllabus, but does that make students get frustrated? What do you think? Justin thinks if you set it up ahead of time and tell them the expectations that the syllabus will change. And that's the thing about teaching online. That's the thing about teaching face-to-face. -face. It's the first day that's important. Actually, it's pre-sessions. Three weeks before you start, you set the stage for the class. The hardest part about teaching online is three weeks before it starts. It's setting the expectations up. And if you tell them, this is a skeleton of a syllabus, it will change. They'll, you know, they'll respect you for that. And then when you do change it, tell them, remind them. And, and you know, in week one, I told you it's going to change. And here's an example of how we're changing it. And you all voted. Have them vote. If they think it's OK to change the syllabus, have them vote. And that way they have ownership over it and have them suggest the changes to the syllabus. That's another way to go. Yeah, 80% of the work, exactly. Um, your chair won't buy it, that you're going to change the syllabus. OK, go with your department chair then and use some of the other ideas. Um, but at the same time, if you do change something and you get good feedback from your students, share that with your chair. Be sneaky about it a little bit. Find out what works and share what works back with your chair after the semester ends. 
or have your students go to the chair and say, you know, Dr. Bonker, Dr. Whiting here, he, you know, he, he moved things around and I really appreciated that. So testimonials help. Internships and practicums and job experiences. Having your students in different discussion forums or threads in Blackboard, in Desire to Learn, in Moodle, discuss their internships or practicums because one of your students might have a bad field experience. You know, in the military, I'm sure this happens a lot with Major Tom. Some people don't have good experiences. And if you can read 25 other students in the class who had great experiences, you're less likely to drop the major or the course. So internship reflections can also connect the book knowledge to the real world. It's a way to connect lectures and everything together. And you as an instructor can point out what you've learned from it and what they missed. And their peers can respond to each other. So you can summarize a bit. You can reuse blog transcripts. You can reuse interviews of authors. Most authors today are interviewed by somebody and podcasted. Why not use those interviews and bring them back to your class like Don Tapscott there in the bottom middle from Toronto. Don reflects on his book Wikinomics and his book Grown Up Digital. And I've reused those transcripts. I've reused the interviews in my classes to get my students to feel the instructor, to feel, to feel Don Tapscott, the author, a bit. And I've actually brought Don in. OK, everyone loves Don's. Thank you for the comment on Don's book. Um, interesting guy, Don Tapscott, if you haven't heard from him. Uh, maybe we should type his name in, Justin. Why don't you go to his website, Justin, and type in Don Tapscott's uh, homepage. Uh, reusing online discussion transcripts. You know, if students are discussing in Blackboard, in course sites, or in Moodle, why not, if you meet face-to-face -face once in a while, or if you're only online, why not have them look for key concepts in them? Print them out and circle once in a while the concepts they're learning. Why not have competitions? to see which groups can find the most concepts in the transcripts, in the discussions. Reuse those. Reuse the blogs. Reuse the conferences. I mean, reuse this MOOC in some ways. Some of you are going to do that. Find a blog tool and let students decide on their blog tool. This semester I made everyone use WordPress. For the last five years, I let them pick anything they wanted to use. And so have a, a way for students to use and post personal blog transcripts. Reflect on what they're learning in the class in a personal blog, but then summarize key points that they're learning. Summarize key things in the blog. Always reuse, reflect, and so forth. Free text chats. Have a text chat with an author. Uh, bring them in free over the internet. Many times I'll talk to the author and I'll say, can you talk to my students about the book? What new version you're working on? I know in the K-12 space, this book, Podcast Wikis and Blogs, Oh My, E-Learning's Not in Kansas Anymore, by Will Richardson. You know, it's a very popular book for K-12. And I'll bring Will Richardson into my class or I'll bring someone in global education, pop them right into my class and, you know, and boom, they're in my class, you know. And so you know, these are ways in which to excite students about learning. Now, poll number 13, let's go back to a, a different poll type there, Haziz. Uh, go to a five-part poll, if you could. Uh, switch the poll type, that's great. Which of these reflection activities might you use? Internship, practicum, and job reflections. Reflections on expert blogs, talks, and interviews. Discussion transcripts, blog transcripts, and chat reflections. We'll see what they say. Question has come in. Um, I'll have Kim read this question. She's popped me this little question. Go ahead and give us what you think the answer should be, Kim. Linda asks, what do you think of service learning projects in an online course? What do you think? Um, Dr. Monk, I'll give that over to you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kim, for helping on. Kim's been in the blog, and she's been in the MOOC quite a bit. You've seen her name all over the place. She used to teach in elementary school and won many awards, and she got the top grade in my class last year, and it shows. She's just so creative. That's why I wanted her answer. What do you think of service learning projects in an online course? Because ah, I don't know the answer to that. Um, anyhow, um, you know, I think. I think we should have options in our class. And the last option in the class should be service learning or doing something for society. I call it a do-gooder assignment. Do something that helps someone else out. Other people look at it as slave labor. I, I, if you have it as a requirement, 
it's slave labor. If you have it as an option and they pick and choose it, I don't think it's slave labor at all. I think if the student has decided to do a service learning activity or something that helps a member of their family out, maybe they're tutoring their roommate or their brother or sister, I think that has value if they can reflect on it and connect it to your class. Right now we've got reflections on blogs, the top answer. Reflecting on blogs and, and talks and interviews. Interesting. Number two answer is internship reflections. More things. You can have students reflect on book author podcasts. Listen to a book author, and MIT does this a lot today. Louise said we need to help students identify what to do that contributes to their learning goals with service learning. Exactly. So not only do service learning for the sake of service learning, but have them reflect, debrief, I don't do a good job of debriefing and reflection. I have to remind myself all the time. It's not just about finishing the activity. It's reflecting on why you did it. It's connecting to the content in the book. Fostering metacognition, thinking about your thinking. So don't just read the book. Listen to an author podcast. Reflect on why they wrote the book and where their research is going next and what didn't get in the book, what the book publisher deleted from the book how things changed over time. Have them go to a virtual conference or a MOOC like this. Aziz can't fly, Aziz can't fly here from, from um, Abba, Saudi Arabia, from King Khalid University, KKU. If you get a chance to go to KKU, they're building a futuristic campus. Everything's a spaceship, you know. Soon he'll be able to fly here in a spaceship. But, um, you know, right now, he's got to come here via the MOOC. And this is one way that students can meet others around the world. This is one way in which they can understand what's happening globally and internationally. And if you're reading the Chronicle of Higher Education this week in the US, if you're reading The Guardian in the UK, if you're reading most things in Canada, university business, most universities are talking about global education today and starting um, collaborative projects. Kelly in DC has second life for people with uh, certain special needs and disabilities. She's teaching people in Libya how to teach English, I believe, and other countries in the Middle East. Have, them, have your people turn to their partner. I have critical friends in my classes. They turn to their critical friend and summarize. They turn to their email pal and summarize what they've learned. They turn to their web buddies. Everybody has an email pal. In Norway, they have a lot of focus on second life intercultural collaboration. Good, good point on that. I don't know who, who made that point, but it's a good point. Um, attend a real conference and then reflect online is another good point. Thank you for that comment on that. Yep, that's another good point. Thanks very much for, for ma uh, Major Tom. Thanks again for pointing it out. Um, so think pair share is a safe activity. You're talking to one person who might give you feedback on your ideas before sharing it with the class. And so you might have some kind of activity where you turn to your partner and then share with the entire group after that. Or pluses, minuses, and interesting. What are the pluses of today's MOOC talk? What are the negatives? And what are the interesting things that you learned about in the chat window from Justin and Kim and Major Tom and, 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 and Jackie and others and Zachary posting? See, because a lot of times students will post, point out what's, what's um, negative and, and what's interesting often is the good stuff. So you, you have to have the interesting column. But it's a way of dividing their thinking up. Another way to divide thinking up is KWL. What did you already know about this topic? What do you want to know? What more do you want to know? And what did you learn? And so KWL, how will you learn it? KWHL. You can do this in Blackboard, in course sites. You can do this in Moodle, or Sakai, or Desire to Learn, or in a wiki or in a blog post. You can do this in many ways. Issue cards and discussions. Having students bring into the discussion forum questions that they have for the instructor, issues that they want to raise, question cards, and then maybe assign teams to solve those issues or resolve them or discuss them. My department chair in school psychology at Indiana, Dr. Jack Cummings, who, who was dean here last year and made the 27 videos I did free to the world, when he first taught online in 1996, he said he had two groups on a pro side and two on a con side debate issues in a structured controversy. And then he had people switch roles and debate from the other point of view. 
and give feedback to different teams on their debates in school psychology. And he said it was wonderful. And the first time Jack taught online, he had seven students and he almost died. The next semester it had 20 students and he said, Kurt, you can teach it. And I said, you almost died with seven. He said, you can teach it, you can teach it, you've been doing blended learning, you can do it. And I had 20 and I almost died. The next semester I had 25 and it was easy. And the next semester I had 30 and it was easy. You see, the first time you do something, it's hard whether you have one student, two students, seven students, or 20. Don't give up. And Jack found that structured controversy was one of the best activities he's ever used online because it brings out a collaborative team activity, it's a debate activity, it gets tension, and you come to compromise. You can do it face-to-face -face or online. Venn diagrams, circles, look for overlaps between two or more ideas. What are the similarities between a MOOC and teaching face-to-face? -face? What are the differences between a MOOC and teaching face-to-face? -face? Do a Venn diagram on it or do a force field analysis. What are the forces helping drive this MOOC to completion? What are the forces restraining you from getting your badge in the MOOC? What are things that are helping and restraining and doing a force field analysis to see? Or doing a poplet, as someone pointed out. We had poplet up there last week. Yeah, using these tools to put your ideas down about those things that are helping and hindering. Pruning the tree. I can say, you know, I'm thinking of the, um, I'm thinking, let's see here, of the most impressive country in the world um, in terms of technology and education in the 1990s. And you can say to me, is it in a country, yes or no? So go ahead and ask me a question and I'll say yes or no. The most impressive country in the world in terms of e-learning in the 1990s. Post your question. Is it in Europe? Yes, it's in Europe. It's not in Asia, Albert. It's in Europe. Now you can guess me another question. Is it in Scandinavia? Yes, it's in Scandinavia. Ask me another question. Is it uh, in today's slides? Is it Norway? No, it's not Norway. It is Finland. Thank you very much. A couple of people got it. It is in Finland. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dorit. Thank you, uh, Albert. Okay. Now I can say, what's the most um, interesting country in the world in the early part of the 2000, actually there are, yeah, there are, from 1998 to 2002, the most interesting things happening in e-learning. From 1998 to 2002, what country is it, I'm guessing? Is it in Africa? No. Is it the United States? No. Is it Australia? No, it's not Korea. Uh, did someone say, we did get the answer up there. I think someone did say it here. Maybe not. No one's guessed it yet. I do not see it yet. England, Japan, Canada. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you, Sherry. It is Canada. Thank you, Sherry, coming from Calgary. Um, Canada. They, they had the total learning centers of excellence there. After that, in, 19, in 2002, I would say Korea has sprung up as the big one. And, and, and Australia throughout this, if I was to say one place throughout this whole time, it's been Australia as the one um, constant in this space. But that's pruning the tree concept attainment is pruning the tree, and I can get everybody involved with pruning the tree. You notice it's an activity here we used very quickly in here. Uh, visual thinking activities like semantic feature analysis, is this trait there or not? We have T-Rex, we have Stegosaurus and Triceratops. Uh, Are they plant eaters? Do they fly? Do they swim? Is it there or not? Semantic feature analysis. Minute papers. Uh, what about so Arab countries? <laughs> okay, I'm thinking about a country in the world that wants to be the leader in the Middle East, um, that wanted to, wanted to be the leader in the Middle East for e-learning from 2004 until 2008. What is the country? It is the UAE. Thank you, Mitch. Since 2009, what country in the Middle East has wanted to be the leader in e-learning since 2009? in the Middle East, and you're, many of you are guessing it, it is Saudi Arabia. Interesting, yes, wants to be the leader, trying anyhow. Maybe the one constant there is as maybe been places like Qatar, um, Bahrain, Israel, all those places as well. Um, Egypt, I'm not so sure. Minute papers, having your students point out in a one-minute paper what's fuzzy, what's complete, what they got, what they didn't get.
and having them send you an email of what they learned or, or post it in a discussion forum. Not too often, you don't want to do this a lot, but having students point out and do formative evaluation of your class. An online resource library is where I have my students look for 10 or 20 or 30 articles in an online library and summarize them in one page or two or three pages. Very brief summaries of articles. And librarians are great. Thank you, uh, Jan Janice. We all need librarians today. Cybrarians. The most important job in the university is a librarian. Cybrarian. I have my students go to online resources and summarize them. Dozens and dozens of things. And I thought they'd hate me for it. But it's the one week they control, and they summarize lots of stuff. They do five times as much work than I would ever assign them, but they control that one week. It gets them some say in the class. ORL. I have a discussion thread with everyone's name on it, and they post what they're learning in their respective articles, and they give feedback to each other. Of these five activities, poll number uh, 14, which of these critical thinking activities might you use? Listen and reflect to book author podcasts, reflect on a virtual conference or event, structured controversy, minute papers, or an ORL, online resource library, or, or library day. Interesting to see what, what we have for answers here. Do we have more questions coming in in the MOOC? I think I've got most of them. Some people like them all. I should have option F, but we only have five choices here. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, uh, favorite links for object learning object repositories. Uh, I think you can go to the o OER Commons, Janice, OER Commons or Connections or Merlot. The number one answer is structured controversy followed by minute papers followed by listening to author podcasts um, and um, online resource library. Lowest rated is a virtual conference. OK. We're going to get a break here in a little bit and then come back in about 10, 15 minutes. We'll take a break and then come back. TED Talk. So in Fox Valley, Fox Valley, I'm from Milwaukee originally and not far from Appleton. My niece is up there at Oshkosh. Um, reflection papers, teams reflecting on what they've learned. If they read a book like Learning Journeys, reflect on what they've read. As a team, you might reflect in wiki spaces or PB Wiki, or in Google Documents, or in Meeting Words, or in Ning, or in Course Sites. Reflect and summarize in a group reflection paper. Do a super summary. TED is Technology, Entertainment, Design, and Kim will type in the link for TED Talks, and for TED Ed, Kim, if you could as well, that'd be great. Reflection papers, uh, job applications. I have my students reflect on their current jobs. Someone, uh, Learning Object Repositories Trust, and if you could type in Merlot and Connections and OER Commons for people, that would be great. And Jerem from the UK for British people and UK people. Um, job application papers, rel relate your current job to your learning in the class. Right? Hooray! Hooray! Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Hooray! Reflection papers, trend papers, having students reflect on trends they see in the field. Value lines, having a value line where people might post on, on the line whether they agree or disagree with a statement or a comment or a trend or a um, controversial um, remark from a political leader, potentially cast your votes, hear how other people vote. I might pull you in Blackboard here and illuminate and then re-pull you based on the votes. Case-based learning, having students post cases based on their field experiences. Here at Indiana, I have st student teachers go to schools and they post cases of problems in Indiana. Students in Finland post cases in Finland. Students in Korea post cases from Kyunghee University in Korea, where Myung met me last for the first time in September. I have people post from Peru, in Lima, Peru. We have someone from Peru with us. I have people post from South Carolina and from Texas A&M and from Warwick University in the UK. We're all posting case problems in a gigantic case repository and solving each other's cases. So it's not just cases from me, but they have cases in a repository where we solve each other's. 
two heads are better than one, having students post a summary and their critical friend post a summary of their learning for the day, and then have the pair create one summary across the two summaries. Or best three ideas. I can have you post the three best things from today's MOOC, and then have you point out what three ideas Kim had, what three ideas Justin had, what three ideas Major Tom had, or Yua, or Jessica, or Zachary, or Dorit. Have you all post, and then as a group, come to the best three. Always pare down and summarize. You know, it's not just one smiley face idea. We want three ideas, the best three ideas. This is one way to get people to synthesize, summarize, evaluate, and share. Poll 15, pick one of these critical thinking activities that you might use. Reflection papers, value lines, case-based learning, two heads are better than one, or best three. Let's see what people say. I can give you three fish. I think I got three. There we go. Three fish with me. Best three fish. Okay. What we have so far, we've got 241 people in with us in the MOOC this week. Thank you all for coming for week three. And the best idea so far is case-based learning. Two heads are better than one. And best three. Interesting. Uh, we also have... Um, Reflection papers, value lines get the lowest on all of this, but case-based learning. Okay, great. We're almost halfway there. Um, what do you think the best two ideas? If you've got anything you really like so far, go ahead and share in the chat window um, the best two ideas that you like so far. I'm going to keep going as you're sharing those in the in making a commitment. Okay, making a commitment is, a, is, a, is one idea. Just in time teaching. Two heads are better than one. Minute papers, scavenger hunts, transcripts, force field, goal setting. We've done a lot here in the first 35. Pair and share. These are things, by the way, you can use in face-to-face -face classes, blended classes, video conferencing, or fully online. Trend papers, structured controversy, scavenger hunts, just-in-time teaching, icebreakers, free text chats work applications. Let's look at creative thinking. I post all students, and, and, and by the way, it's not just creative thinking and exploration, I call it. So it's not just creative thinking. Exploring. My, my entire Web 2.0 class is on the web. 54 pages of a syllabus. Students can explore and find stuff. They can have choice in it. I also post my lectures on the web in my learning theories class, and I flip my classroom so class time can be spent more on problem solving. So if you post up in the web your weekly discussions online, you can, you know, Eileen has joined us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining Maybe you joined us a long time ago. I, I've just caught in here. Uh, but uh, flipping the classroom a bit, nominating quotes, having students go to wiki quotes and nominate Shakespeare quotes or Darwin quotes, or Jane Austen quotes, or Mahatma Gandhi quotes, or Mother Teresa quotes, or you know, Sir Edmund Hillary, or Winston Churchill, or President of uh, Prime Minister of, uh, of Australia. What's her name? I've forgotten. If, and I don't know if she's quotable. I don't know if she's got anything in wiki quotes, but I'm sure she, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, that's right. Julia is with us, right? And um, we've got people with us from the UAE. Who's the current um, Sheikh? Uh, not Sheikh Nahran, who's the um, he was uh, he was the head of the higher colleges of technology when I was there last. But uh, how about in Saudi Arabia, the the King Abdullah, right? Uh, what is some quotes you might put up? Oscar Wilde quotes. Is Oscar Wilde like, the Sheikh of the the UAE? I didn't think so. <laughs> oh, just, just, just kidding. Just, just kidding. <laughs> one visual. Having students post one visual of their learning. You know, this is a way to condense into one thing. One visual representation of what they've learned in the class. Or one idea, one theme, one point, one bumper sticker, one quote, one slogan. Synthesizing and distilling it down. 
or having students tell a tall tale. They start a story. In one K-12 project, there's called the New Horizons Projects, where kids tell a story. And they send their story in a wiki. And other kids add to the story. And they add to it. And they share this around the world. It's one idea, anyhow, to use the power of the web to do creative writing in a wiki, to use meeting words to tell a story, or wiki spaces to tell a story. Or just suppose, in a chat window, just suppose this MOOC was available every month. And you could go online and revisit this every month, or a MOOC like this, and get training all the time about teaching online. What would teaching be like? Just start typing in the chat window. Mutsafa, go ahead and type in the chat window there. You know, picture is more better than a thousand words. That's right. You know, sail the th you know, the pictures. Uh, what uh, what's that quote there? It launched a thousand ships or ten thousand ships. What was it, Kim? You know, go look that up. For, uh, for who's the the one from Troy? Okay, shows my history. I've lost all. Helen of Troy. Thank you very much, Kelly, and everyone else there. The face that launched it, not the picture that launched it. I'm so dumb. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I'm so stupid. So just suppose, what would like be like, Zachary and Dorit? What would like be like? Just go ahead and chat. Type. So a couple people might type. Oscar, go ahead and type in the chat window. What would it be like, Brian Mulligan? Okay, and Kansas. I, you thought you weren't going to get away with this, Kansas. I, I, Kansas, are you from Kansas? Where are you from, Kansas? Come on, Kansas, let us know. Dottie's with us. It's, Dottie, are you the one with us from Pennsylvania this morning who won my book? Dottie won a book from Pennsylvania, and Ed Frick, not Ted Frick, my department chair, won this book. Are you with us here from this morning? I was doing Pennsylvania people this morning. Cheaper, okay. Life would be cheaper. There we go. Thank you, Brian. Extreme. So, you know, a wet ink, just, uh, just suppose, or a wet ink gets people's minds freed up, right? Wet inking, just typing. What would life be, life be like if we had more activities like this? Just type without lifting your pen, without stopping. Just go ahead and type. Metaphorical thinking. What if teaching was like a prison? Ah! What if teaching was like an orchestra? What if teaching was like a military camp, Major Tom, or a hospital, or a theater, or a circus, or a brew pub, or a, montes a monastery, or um, a synagogue, or a mosque, or you know, it, it was like you know, our political system in the U.S. It wouldn't be that great, would it? Um, <laughs> what if it was like a rugby match in Australia? What if it was like you know, the train the train system in the U.K. or in Europe? What if what if life was like uh, I don't know the beaches there in uh, the Philippines, Boracay Beach? What would life be like? You know. Uh, the Sheikh Zayed Road. There we go. Thank you, Mark. Um, the cone in New Zealand. Yeah, I'm going to have the cone in the book. Thank you very much. Artist palette. Yeah, go ahead and type us. Go ahead and type a metaphor in the window that your teaching is like. My teaching is is like an expedition. Okay, I'm going to type that in. A truck stop. <laughs> weaving, weaving. Okay, mine is like, or I try and make it like an expedition. I'm hopeful. An adventure, a ladder, an archaeological dig, a railroad station. Eileen, did you say railroad station? A city to excite you with. Thank you. An experiment. A pressure cooker. We got it now. A journey. An IMAX theater, a lucky dip. Diane's going to put us in the microwave. <laughs> a zoo, Sandra. Thank you very much. A map, Brian Mulligan's got us on a map. Albert's got us on an experiment. Linda, what did you have? We had a taxi ride. We got cooking, a garden. All right. Reverse brainstorming. Instead of saying, how can Dr. Bonk utilize this MOOC in a better way, how can he utilize it in a worse way? What could go wrong here? reverse brainstorm. Instead of what can go right, instead of how can we decrease cost of higher ed, how can we increase the cost of higher education? You know, instead of how can we not, how can we make this more interactive, how can we make this less interactive? Getting us to think about the opposite. Poll number 16, which of those activities did you like? Putting all your readings on the web, telling a tall tale, just supposing what if, 
wet ink and reverse brainstorming. We're almost at break time here. We got some people saying C, just suppose. But the number one answer, the number one answer, <laughs> let's post those of these. Let's see what you guys have said. Number one is just suppose and what if. Number two, reverse brainstorming. Number three is putting all your course readings on the web. Okay. Not so many with wet inking or telling tall tales. Writing creatively is not what you're here for. You're here for other things. As we found out, critical thinking and collaborative learning. One of the best questions I've been asked, someone said quickly there, I've seen students ask, what would it be, what, what would it be the effect of no class, I'm trying to get that one, um, if the earth spin in the other way? Okay, that's a great question. What if the earth spin in a different way? Great question. What if we had no daylight? You know, what if everything was, you know, we could ask all sorts of questions. Two truths, one lie. Tell two truths about yourself and one lie. That's another activity that you could use um, that people at IBM use. Thank you, Peggy, for that. Um, Rick Culp at IBM gave me that idea in 1999. Small group activities, cooperative learning. Many of you are here for my monkeys. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sandra. Um, small group activities, scholarly role play. I'll enter into Blackboard or into Sakai into OnCourse here at IU, into Moodle, into Desire to Learn, into Angel, into your virtual course management system of any kind, WebCT, whatever you're using, I'll enter in as Mahatma Gandhi, I'll enter in as Socrates and Aristotle, I'll enter in as Mother Teresa and Jane Goodall, and my students don't know I've been all those people. And I pretend, and I pretend they don't like each other, and, and so I do scholarly role play. I do fictional, I do real people in history, we do role play online to get them to interact. I'll give people roles, I'll hand them a slip of paper if we meet face to face. You, know, you saw me as Mickey, who saw me as Mickey Mouse? Who saw me as Mickey Mouse? Planet of the Apes, no I was not Planet of the Apes, I was Mickey Mouse in Copenhagen. Who was that who saw me as Linda Terrell, okay, thank you Linda. <laughs> oh, that was up at, was that up at Purdue? Are you coming from Purdue uh, here in Indiana? Well, I was in Copenhagen as Mickey Mouse once, I think, yeah. Thank you coming through. For, we, we do allow Purdue people into the MOOC, believe it or not. Even though they're five times smarter than anybody, we do let them in. Thank you, Mustafa. So, role play. Mustafa is using role play in Egypt, I'm sure he is. Aziz teaches English there in, in, in Saudi Arabia. I'm sure he's doing role play. Eric. Thank you, Eric, coming from Purdue Online. Thank you. Uh, Perdon't. I didn't say Perdon't. Go Boilermakers. <laughs> you know, this is one of the best activities. And I've got like 28 activities. I've got um, the optimist, the pessimist, the devil's advocate or negative person, the questioner, the commentator, the summarizer, the weaver. And so I might have a debate online where students are in roles where we debate the pro and con. I might have a guest expert come in. I might have someone pretend to be B.F. Skinner in psychology or some other famous psychologist. I might role play personalities, as I said, an optimist, a pessimist, a devil's advocate. And I give Justin the optimist role because he's always the negative person face to face. I have to make him right, Justin. Right, Justin. Is that right, Justin? Yeah. He knows he's always negative in my classes. He never has anything nice to say. I'm just picking on Justin. He's always going like this, thumbs up. So I have to give Justin the negative role. He's always too much sunshine and optimism, actually. Historical role play. You might come dressed in a costume of some kind, maybe as a pirate. You might come dressed as, you know, Blackboard the Pirate or whatever, and come into the class as some historical figure in time. Maybe someone in the Middle East, uh, maybe someone in you know, the Crusades or whatever, maybe we don't want to bring up the Crusades, maybe somebody, in, you know, uh, the, the Greek tragedies or somebody in the French Revolution or, you know, some other time period, um, Roman conquerors of England or whatever. You do historical role plays, dragon fighters, there we go. See how high I can kick, you know. I don't know if I can kick, but you know, we might all we might all jump right now, and we might all jump right now. 
Everyone's getting tired. Everyone's on count of three. Let's all jump right now. One, two, three, jump right now. One, two, three. All the ladies jump with me. All the ladies. All the men jump with me. <laughs> can you still hear me, Justin? Okay. I'm not sure if people can still hear me or not. All the people in the Middle East, let's jump with me. Yeah, all the people in the Middle East. Come on, Mustafa. Come on. All the people in Australia, jump with me. Okay, all the people in uh, Africa, Mexico, and South America, jump with me. Okay, all the people in Europe, jump with me. And all the people in North America, including Mexico, jump again. Okay. <laughs> all right, we needed that. We got five more to go before break, maybe six more. Jigsaw. I sometimes have my students reading books. We can do the wave too. Let's do the wave. Let's do the wave. Let's do the wave. Let's do the wave some more. Okay. Good to have Philly with us here from DC. Is that you, Philly? Okay. Is that my former student coming from DC? Philly one? Hello. Well now. Did you get a job yet? I hate to put you on the spot in front of two, three hundred people. <laughs> uh, come on, Tin Fang, tell us about the job market now in DC. Anyhow, Jigsaw, I divide up my books, in ten chapters, and I give one person chapters one and two, the next person chapters three and four, five and six, seven and eight, nine and ten. All the people who got chapter one and two in the group of five. They join an expert group and talk about chapters one and two in the MOOC, in Blackboard course sites. They go back to their base group after discussing chapters one and two or three and four, and they summarize the book as a team of five people. Each one got two different chapters, and they create the summary of the book as a jigsaw activity. And this gets everyone committed. Everyone has a role. In a face-to-face -face class, I've had students who have been almost deathly ill show up for class because everybody has a role to play. Numbered heads together. I can give you all a number and say group one, number four, group five, number two, or all the number ones in the group. I can count off one, two, three, four, five, group one, one, two, three, four, five, group two, and I can call out group one, number two, group three, number four. Um, adapted readings from Kurt and loved really a collaborative activities. So, okay, who did that? Okay. Interesting, Dorit. Thank you, Dorit, for the comment on there. Um, so this is being recorded, Sandy. Yes, it is. Uh, mock trials with occupational roles, giving people roles of a, you know, a school educator or of a, a mayor of a city or the president of a university or a, or a corporate executive or a professor or a student or whatever role you want to give someone, a counselor, and then doing an activity on the web, a synchronous session like this from a role that you have, or an asynchronous discussion from the role that you have, or giving people different color hats. You know, I have a six hats activity with a white hat. Anyone wearing the white hat is the factual hat, and anyone wearing the red hat or the yellow hat or the black hat, I'm sorry, I don't have any, I have multicolor hats with me here. You know, the black hat is the gloomy hat, and the green hat is the sunshine or the, uh, the creativity hat. The yellow hat's the sunshine hat. The blue hat's the leader of the group. And people play on roles based on the color hat. Philip 66 activities where you give students a short amount of time, six minutes, in groups of six to discuss something and summarize maybe the last class. Summarize what you learned in this class. It's a short six-minute activity in groups of six. You can do it in a synchronous session, in breakout teams. You can do it face-to-face. -face. And then finally, cross-class collaboration. Having my class in Indiana work with kids in Dubai with Mark's class, work with kids in Korea with Myung's class, work with Leanne's students in Deakin University. We're all doing cross-class collaboration. Um, so. This is one way to broaden students' perspectives. This is one way to build, um, I guess, some sense of commitment because you have to know as much as your foreign peers do. My students in Indiana have to know as much as Aziz's students in Saudi Arabia or someone else's students in Belgium. I think Alex is coming from Belgium. Is that right? We got Alex from Belgium and we've got other people coming from uh, Norway and we got Major Tom from Sweden. So which of these activities did you like best? 
Online role play, online panels or symposia, numbered heads together, six hats or cross-class collaboration. Steve McDonough has come back to join us. Thank you, Steve. Jim King is with us from Illinois. We have someone from Illinois, so near St. Louis, I believe. Jenny G is with us. Jennifer is with us. Jeannie Asher is with us. It's good to have Jim in with us. I think he's working with engineers there in Illinois. And John and other people are with us. Some, some Barbara says she's from Chicago. Good to have you with us, Barbara. So which of these? We've got uh, D's and C's being picked by different folks in the group. Let's go ahead and Michael's join the session. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Let's look at the results here of these. We've got um, people picking what answer here. Let's go ahead and post that so I can read that off. There we go. The most people said online role play. And the second uh, most answer is um, 31 said online role play. 29 said cross-class collaboration. And then the um, Six Hats activity, which is a winner. Um, what have you learned so far? List one solid idea and one fuzzy idea in the chat window, or just one solid one, uh, one that you almost learned from this. Go ahead and type in the chat window. As you're typing that in the chat window, I'm going to take a break for five minutes and come back and talk about learner-centered activities, and then 10 more. We have 20 left to go. Uh, we have 20 last activities, but let's take a two minute, three minute, four minute break for people who need to get a stretch their legs, stand up. We got people typing in the chat window, icebreakers, wet inks, jigsaws. Great. Yeah, don't stop the recording. We'll just let it keep rolling. This will be a quick run to the bathroom break, get some tea. I've got my vitamin waters with me here. I've got some chips. I didn't get to share any chips with all of you, but hey, they're here. If anyone wants to visit, we haven't opened these up yet. All right. I'm going to ask that Justin and Kim give me, uh, in the, after we're done, uh, so to select the best question that I'm asked in the session after we're done. And the, the two the questions that they select, they're going to win a book each. So after we um, go through the last 20 activities, I will have you Q&A, and I'll have Kim select, and Kim will select the winner of the World is Open book I'm going to give away, and Justin will pick a winner for my 100 activities book. I will send it to you. If you're somewhere around the world, it will take a couple weeks, but I will get it there. And uh, Julie Zhu is with us here. Hi, Julie, and Julie W. And Jay Reed. Lots of Jay people with us here in the online role play, cross-class collaboration. Blackboard as is a pirate. <laughs> uh -huh. Role play, role play class activities. Take your break. <laughs> is that an activity? Take your break. <laughs> 100 word summaries, six hats. There's lots of different things you can be doing. Notice in week one, week two were more technology focused activities. Week three now, gets us into generic things that can work whether you have technology or you don't have technology. Next week, we're going to get into video. And I'll post 27, a link to the 27 videos you can watch and reflect on. And an article or two I've written on how to use video. So next week, I'm going to give you 10 ways to use video from a teacher-centered point of view and 10 ways from a student-centered point of view. Or we'll talk about those. We need a break. OK, break. I'll be back in a couple minutes. Diana's, Diana has imparted a message. Thanks, Diane. We'll be right back in two, three minutes. Don't stop the recording. Be right back. Maybe I'll, while I'm gone on break, Justin will come sit here and talk about what he's learned. Come on, Justin. You were in my class, so you can tell them which activities do you like the best that we've talked about. Just remind people they're on break. All right, so I'm just filling in break time. So yes, you are supposed to be taking a break. But yeah, my name is Justin Whiting. Uh, I have taken several of Dr. Bonk's classes and, uh, and then TA'd for one of them as well. So I've gotten to see a lot of these ideas several times. Um, and I've taught 
one of the computers and education course here at IU for some of our undergrads. And I've, I've tried to use many of these activities, but yeah, some of the ones that I definitely have liked the most, I love doing the reverse brainstorming especially in, in a, even undergraduate, even in college, you know, they always really get a kick out of seeing that to just think about the opposite of what you're really trying to get them to do. Um, but that one works really well. Uh, when I was first going to one of the, you know, when I first became an associate instructor in some of the training here at Indiana, I think it was one of the biology professors um, here on campus was doing a presentation talking about some tips. And he specifically mentioned the think pair share. And he said even in his, you know, in his 20 years of teaching, he had never had a think pair share that didn't work. So think pair share is always a good basic one. Um, and several, or I saw some of the questions talking about, you know, can you reuse these same activities or do you have to try new ones all the time? Uh, in my experience, I definitely say, yeah, you can reuse these several times throughout a course or throughout a semester. Um, you know, because it can get overwhelming if you try to have a different one every single week. And but, but yeah, absolutely you can. You can pick a few to reuse. You can try new ones and have some that are the same. And I think that works really well. Um, and I know that this is something that Dr. Bonk has mentioned several times in other scenarios too, is combining a couple of these activities. Take a think, pair, share, and combine it with uh, you know something else. And uh, you know, so you can kind of create your own combination activities and find ones that work for you. Um, Ruth is asking, can you overdo it? I'm not sure. I, I think in some ways, maybe you could. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't do the same activity every single week. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, having a few of these ideas, a few of these activities are great for, uh, and again, most of these work in face-to-face -face or online classes just as well. Um, and just really, I think one of the big differences with online learning is, again, getting, uh, getting students to participate and be involved in some of these different activities. Um, so getting them a chance to share their ideas. And uh, as I've been monitoring the chat, when some of the questions have been coming in asking about, you know, some of the class or cross-class collaboration, um, and you know, kind of wondering how do you start with that? How do you start making some of these international connections? And I don't have an exact answer for that, but certainly I think this MOOC is a great place to start building some of these international connections, uh, using our blogs and using the discussion boards to to find people that are teaching uh, in a similar content area. You know, so some of you might be able to, you know, start making some of these connections right here within this MOOC. Say, hey, I know that I'm going to be teaching this over the next little bit, and you know, I want to have my class work with another class somewhere. Is anybody interested in that? I think this is a great place to to take advantage, as we've seen, we've got people all over the world. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've got lots of people asking here. Let's see here. I'm looking through some of the questions here. And, uh, and I know that there, there are websites. Um, one of the websites that a lot of my students went to was using Skype in the classroom. That's kind of a similar kind of idea as you know, using some of these specific tools like Skype to connect to a cross content area. But yeah, wikis are great as well in addition to just some of these other uh, cr cross class cr collaboration activities. So, so yeah, I think I don't know that there's a specific right way to start them. I think you just have to start them would be you know, one thing to try and starting to make some of these connections with other people here. So, thanks, Dr. Bonk. Oh, thank you, Justin. And, um, you know, he's got some wide experiences, having been my teaching assistant a couple of times in my classes. And, again, we've got people coming with us from around the world. We've put your names on this globe. And um, we're going to keep track of who's coming from around the world and write your little notes. Uh, we got 20 left here, and then we'll go to some Q&A. And people are door to saying thank you, Justin. Major Tom says thank you, Justin. So uh, Kim has, you know, also been uh, in my classes. And world is open. Yep, thanks, Mustafa. World is definitely open for learning. And so uh, yeah, a lot of folks are typing in, Peggy and uh, Anna and others. So uh, Maria, you may know Justin. I'm not sure. Uh, but some of you may know Justin. Um, Kim's typing in hers as she's typing in hers on a slip of paper. Let's look at 10 learner-centered activities, including voting and polling, which we just did in here. You know, we can have people vote on what they think. And you can pull out the minority point of view before the majority might dominate discussion. If you do a poll online and meet people face to face, Major Tom, you might find that only a couple of people picked A or picked C. And you might pull that out before everyone else is discussing. And here's a question coming in 
from Marcia. Um, can you give an example of high risk, high cost, high time activities? I think that was her question. Another one here, how do you most K-12 classes deal with block systems when on online learning in terms of um, all collaborations are wanted? A couple things there. Um, so what are some high risk, high cost, high time things? Well, doing a wiki book like I did online is a high time activity and sort of high risk because you're really giving uh, control up to the students in creating the final project. Uh, in terms of high cost activity, anything where you might have to buy a technology uh, that, you know, like a simulation tool or some kind of animation tool, that might, uh, might be a high, high cost kind of thing. In terms of school firewalls, what I tell people is that um, use these ideas that can get through the firewall first. Start with the safe things. Start with ideas that people understand and can use. And then go to, uh, and then showcase the things that work, and then get approval for some of the things that are behind the firewall. So start with what, what has been approved and showcase them first, then try out something that's, that's like, you know, the use of something that might be, um, might be more difficult to get approval for. Paul asks, how do I connect my class to other classes around the world? If you're, uh, where, where is Paul from? in the U.S. If you're in the U.S. here, there's a system called SOLIA, S-O-L-I-Y-A, S-O-L-I-Y-A. It's for connect connecting U.S. students and the Middle East, so, uh, getting students to talk to others in, in Dubai and in, 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 in so forth. So um, we'll see where Paul is from. If you're, and what grade level, uh, what grade level you're teaching, Paul? Yeah, I see you're in Mass, UMass, um, Worcester, um, and um, university level. So Solia might be something you check out and use. If you're at the K-12 level, there's something called ePals and also something called iEARN. That's, that's, um, and if you're, if you're really interested in all this, Go to Extreme Learning, my web, our, our website, www.extremelearning.com. We've indexed about 50 different global collaboration software tools. Poll everywhere. Yep. Uh, and we've indexed a number of things like Solia, like ePals, and so forth that you might be able to use to do cross-class, cross-cultural collaboration activities. You might just um, contact someone that you know in another country or post up in a discussion forum the fact that you want to work with someone else. Online polling. Oh, and by the way, Kim's favorite activities. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. And Kim is active in the discussion forum. She said her favorite activities, and, and she asked that I read these. Think, pair, share, KWL, Venn diagrams, round robin, and anything collaborative in nature. Online book reviews. Your students today can be doing book reviews in Amazon or some other space. Have them post their book reviews up on the web and, and get some authorship. I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> so do I. Volunteer technology demonstrations. Having your students demonstrate a technology. Have your students showcase a technology. Have your students take you to a computer lab if it's a face-to-face -face class and show you something that you don't know about and let them delete any assignment from that demo. If they do a demo, they can delete something. Cool resource provider, everyone in my class signs up to show us something on the web that's interesting that I don't know about, something new that I've never seen that adds to my class. If we meet face-to-face, -face, they get a little bit of class time to show it. We, if we never meet face-to-face, well, then we post it online in a discussion thread, in a discussion forum. Justin's got the question from Sukiana. How do you motivate adults who just want to get through the course? They think role play is a waste of time. And that's a good point. Use the activities that they find relevant. List 10 or 20 activities that you could be using in your class and utilize those. Find out what's motivating for them. Library day might work really well because you can give them power to read the stuff they want to read. Adults want choice. Adults want relevance. Adults want authentic learning. Adults want meaningful learning. They might not want a debate. They might not want role play. Remember my notion of risk. 
high risk activities with adults include those things where you're doing creativity, where you're doing role play, where you're breaking people out of their, their um, standard day. What they want is something that impacts their job. So job application papers. They want to do trend papers. They want to do um, something that they can use in their work setting, like doing a technical report evaluation, like doing a strategic plan for their unit, like doing a podcast on other organizations and what they're doing that are similar to where they're working, an evaluation maybe, a video of what they've learned that links to the class. Find authentic tasks that link in to their current job and utilize them where you can. Start with that. And like I said, the um, library day activity works really well. Um, what Ruth says, what do you think will be the next technology that, that will change the way people will learn? Um, I don't know if there's ever been a the technology. Um, but right now we're in the midst of mobile learning. As I've said before, I think the thing that we're going to see happen is a convergence. And we'll have the, this, the screen bend out and fold out into larger screens. Or I'll click a button and the screen will appear off of my mobile, de my convergent device. It may be an iPad that's shrinkable. We may have an iPhone or iPad-like device that expands and contracts or that has a view screen that widens on it. Um, some kind of convergent device will, from a technology standpoint. From a pedagogy standpoint, I think open education is changing the world today. Glasses, 3D glasses, maybe, I don't know. That's a good question for gallery tours, just posting people's work up in a poster session in a gallery tour, getting experts to give feedback to students in an online gallery. Students want to see their work on display. So the question earlier, adults would like to get activities where their work is shareable. So do kids. They want their grandparents to see it. They want their parents to see it most of the time. So a gallery showcasing students' work is a wonderful thing that can be done. A question came in from Fred. Choices, how many is too many? Is there a, uh, a sweet number? I found that 10, um, pick any four, works really well. I'd say probably 8, 12 might be pushing it if you want them to do one or two or three or four things. If you give them more than 12 options, that might be too many. If you give them four or five, that's not enough. Somewhere between 6 and 12 options. It's a great question. And for different age groups, you'll have to experiment with different age groups and what that means because it also depends on content area and how many times you've taught them if you've had that group before. What is the museum? Uh, there is a bunk museum in Finland, if people are asking about that. Um, it's a fictional museum. Take a look. I can get you all bunk t-shirts. There actually is a museum. You can get experts to give students feedback on their galleries, on their projects. Number 62, having quotes and time things. So I have a timer here. I can set this timer to 99 seconds and give people 99 seconds to make a point. There are online timers where you can set a timer for so much time to make a point. There are online dice. You can roll the dice and say, if it, it's a six, we'll do this activity. It's a four, we'll do that activity, or whatever. So you know, there's, there, there are card games you can, you can get. You, know, you can have a deck of cards, and you, know, you can have people select from an, uh, there's a uh, website where you pick cards out, and you might go to the next activity based on the card that's been picked. There's all sorts of ways to change things up. Uh, 99 seconds gets students to talk for 99 seconds. And when 99 seconds is up, they're done. Some of you wish I would stop talking now, I'm sure. Set time presentations. I can set my clock to six minutes, or four minutes, or three minutes. Again, it's a way to allocate time or sections. Press conference. Having a couple of students like I have here, Justin wrapped around me and Kim wrapped around me, we can have a press conference of the three of us on what we have been learning. And we could have a group presentation in a synchronous forum like this. All three of us could present and others could critique us. Or we could do problem-based learning where you give students a problem to solve and they spend the semester or the class designing a solution. 
<clears throat> poll number 18, which of these activities do you like best? Class voting and polling, getting their minority points of view out, online book reviews, online uh, cool resource providers, gallery tours, and 99 second quotes. Donna Gibbons has joined the session. Thank you for joining us, Donna. Kelly Kearns is here. Kay Hampshire is here. Kimberly Cullen is here. Luis Savrada. Sal Sal Lynn from Little Rock. Well, Lynn from Little Rock. Good to have you here, Lynn from Little Rock. Several are asking if these are synchronous activities versus asynchronous. Which ones work best asynchronously? A great question. Um, Sarah and y'all posted some articles from me. One of the articles they posted for this week is called The Perfect E-Storm, Part 1 and Part 2. In Part 2, I have 10 activities for synchronous and 10 activities for asynchronous. So if you're interested in which of these activities work best in a synchronous like this, which work best in asynchronous, go to the MOOC, download that free article. It was done after I gave a talk in Abu Dhabi back in 2003 or 2004, somebody in the UK at the Observatory of Borderless Education wrote me a note, said he liked the talk I gave in Abu Dhabi, could I write a paper? And I wrote a two-part paper that I had hoped to become a book. I had given the perfect e-storm talk there, and, and Haziz, if you, Haziz, could you post the results? I would given this talk in a raincoat in Abu Dhabi where it never rains, and <clears throat> um, it was an interesting talk, and anyhow, I posted, and, and after one year, this article was made free to the world. So you can use that article. I had hoped to become a book. I never became a book. It's a technical report out of the UK. Who's with us from the UK, by the way? Go ahead and chat in the, type in the chat window where you're from. If anyone's from the UK with us here, um, I don't know who's with us from the UK. Um, Liverpool, that's right, Ruth from Liverpool. And um, Anatoly from the UK somewhere. North Umberland, Northeast Leicester. I've been to Leicester with Julie Salmon many times. Southampton, Elisa, Stephen, London. Great to have. Uh, how's London going for the for the you know we got what the the Olympics coming there, right? Craziness. So it looks like most people are saying class voting. We still have 168 of the 200 and some people with us initially. Uh, book reviews. Uh, quite a while, everyone, everything, everyone, uh, you know, a lot of people would like to do everything, I think. So finally, 10 interaction activities. The monkeys are still with us. Interviews, having peer interviews and introduce your peer after interviewing them. Instead of introducing yourself, introduce your peer online in an asynchronous forum or in a face-to-face. -face. Personal reflections in a blog or team reflections. Everyone might have a blog in a team member might give you feedback, a critical friend might give you feedback, and what I grade, what I evaluate is the summaries of their blogs. They're two-page summaries of what they've learned. They're super summaries. Peer mentoring. I have my students sign up for, for chapters they're comfortable with, chapters they're not comfortable with, and they mentor each other online or face-to-face. -face. They, they, they get power to mentor each other. Human graphs. Justin, come up here for a second. So I might, I might, and I know, I know Kim's gonna. Check it. So I might say, on a scale of one to five, do you like this chapter? And Justin and I might rate it a four, both of us. So we'll stand in front of each other, both of us like it as a four, uh, and then Justin might rate it a five. Let me stand over there. I'm gonna rate it a three, and so I'm over here as a three. You can barely see me anymore. And you know, so I might have people rate in a human graph, and all the fives line up here, all the threes over here, all the twos over there. And it gets people to, on camera to see that people in Chicago love the book that we're reading. Everyone likes the book you know, that I had up here, podcast wikis and blogs. They all love this book by Will Richardson. He grew up in Chicago. So of course they're going to like his book. But people here in Indiana, they don't like this book. He's not from Indiana, so you know, it's junk. You know? So they line up and give it a one. I'm just kidding, all my friends there in, in Illinois. But the point is that my students here in Indiana want theory books. They want deep thinking theory books. They want big picture, world is open. They don't want to read the practical 100 activities, but teachers in the, in the real world, they want to read practical stuff. 
And so they'll put a human graph up in Chicago. They love the book. Here in Indiana, they hate the book. Planted questions. I might give Justin a question to ask me in the middle of this session. Right, Justin? I've done that to you before. You know, there's Justin over there. I left the room and I made him teach once, I just like I just did in here. Yeah, I pretended I was really mad at my class. I was mad at my class, and I left the room, and Justin taught my class. I can plant, you can plant things ahead of time so they don't know what's going to happen. Spontaneity. You might also post in Blackboard, in Moodle, in the discussion forum, a whole bunch of questions, and let students pick the answers, pick the questions to answer. In the shotgun approach, or in the hot seat approach, I can say Maggie's in the hot seat, Lynn's in the hot seat this week. Um, Malcolm's in the hot seat. Major Tom, no. He's, he's in the cold seat. I might give Margaret, and the person in the hot seat has to answer everybody's questions. Student selected lectures, having students decide on the lectures for the day. Instead of having it pre canned, let them decide. Bingo quizzes. I might have a bingo board and you know these little rolly things and, and and I have questions with each number I might say I18 or or um you know N35 and if they have the number on their bingo board they can answer the question and the person with bingo wins a free book or something rapid data collection having students go in the real world and collect data with a survey tool like zoomerang and survey monkey and poll everywhere and and whatever micro poll collect real world data online and share that with the class and then finally stand and share having people stand up and share what they learned from today and when they hear their answer their idea shared they sit down and it's a way to get everyone to stand and share and so I could say right now, okay, <coughs> I just lost my camera, and there we go, I lost my headset. I've got to be careful about standing up here, uh, I could lose my brain. <laughs> it said train. Okay, everyone stand up and type in as you're standing one idea you got from this last 20 that we've been after break. What's one idea maybe that you got? And as you hear your idea shared, you can sit down. You don't have to share it a second time. So the human graph, okay, stand and share, and the hot seat, and uh, questioning ideas, and bingo quizzes. Notice they're picking all the last five I just did. Memory, memory doesn't go back in time that far. Team blogs and summaries. And, and as you hear your idea, you can sit down, okay? And so we've got a lot of questions coming in. I'll be answering these questions. People want to win a book. 99 second quotes, planted questions, um, you just wanted to stand. I didn't have any ideas, I just want to stand, she says. <laughs> Peer mentoring, problem based learning, right, okay. So of these final five activities, planted questions, hot seat, bingo quizzes, rapid data collection, stand and share, which one did you like? Pick one. Okay. Bingo quizzes, bingo. Bingo! <laughs> I got a dog named Bingo. All right, all right. I'm going to take Bingo with me on a ride. Mastura joined the session. Thank you for joining us. What's his name, oh? <laughs> uh, someone is a professional bingo caller. Is that you, Kirk? Professional bingo caller? Captain Kirk? Kirk Miller? Uh, stand and share. Okay, so pretty even here. Hot seat, bingo, rapid, day, hot, even. Everyone likes everything. Good deal. Uh, number 20, which did you like best? Creative thinking activities. And by the way, I didn't put the warm up activities. I, I, I missed one here. But creative thinking, exploration, critical thinking, small group, um, collaboration, learner centered, and these final 10. Maria's still here. We've got lots of questions here. Oh, my goodness. All right. Hopefully you've got something out of today's session. Right now, it's a critical thinking neck and neck with learner-centered activities. Interesting. OK. And there are more critical thinking that we went through than learner-centered. That's a lot of stuff this week. We're not going to have as many ideas next week. We're going to just have 20. We're going to limit this week with 75. It's a lot of ideas. It's a small file, though. A lot of text this week. Bye, Dr. Bonk, says Patty. Bye-bye, Patty. Yes, Paul. It's 
too late to remember everything. My brain hurts. Okay. How many of you got at least three ideas? Well, you can go ahead and type in. You get zero ideas if you're lucky. One or two, three to five, six to ten, more than ten. Go ahead and type in. All right. Looks like people got at least three to five. Many of you getting more than that. Excellent. Thanks for sharing. Many C's in here. That's all you need. Three to five. Three to five is a good number. Mary Jane, thanks for joining us. Do I know you, Mary Jane? Marty, thanks. Marticia, all C's. Okay, in the chat window, people in Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. Three words from today's session or three activities you learned. Any, any three things. Words, activities. Hee-haw. Hee-ha-ha-ha. People in Asia, that includes Korea, by the way. <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> bless, bless, bless. All right. New Zealand. Australia. 99 second stuff. Smiley face. <clears throat> How about those in Europe join in? Go ahead, people from Europe. Have to go. Okay. Challenges. Simulations. Okay. How about... We go to, it was great. Thank you, Julie, for joining us from Indianapolis. Let's go to Mexico and South America. Dorit, thank you. Thank you, Dorit. Thank you, Sandra. Middle East, Mex let's go Mexico, South America. Connect, reverse, and choice. Interesting three words. Javier, 99 seconds. That's two words. Give us one more. Mustafa, thanks. That's one word. Give us two more. Middle East and Africa. Add you all in there. Canada, let's add you in too. Middle East, Africa, and Canada. Blackboard the pirate. Fred, he hung up on that one. Hey, right, Fred. JIT, JIT, summarize, share, and togetherness. Ah, Linda. Let's go to the USA since Linda's coming in here from USA. Quick polling, reverse thingy. <laughs> Sharing, bingo. Okay. Questions and comments as they're typing in. Let's see what we got for questions in here. Sharon asks, copyright issues with wikis and blogs. Well, reuse of them, you know, as a class activity, I don't think you're going to have any problem of, re of using something. It's when you display a blog uh, in a talk or in a paper, there's where you have copyright issues. I don't think anything that's public domain, and if you, a, you have to look at the bottom of the screen and look at Creative Commons rights to it. Does it say, uh, the Creative Commons code, does it say share alike? Does it say not share? So, um, you know, if it's, if it's a copyrighted um, blog of some kind, you might not want to use it as a class activity. But look at the bottom of any resource on the web today and see if there's a code and then click on the code. That will indicate the rights you have to use it. <clears throat> Thank you, Terry Anderson. Terry, where are you from? I mean, I thought you were the Terry, the, the Terry Anderson. We sang your birthday. You know, I mean, it's, it's happy birthday, Terry. Florida. This is the Florida Terry Anderson? You've got to be. Well, of course, all the Canadians are in Florida right now. I forgot about that. Paul says, how do I connect my class to the class? We had that one. Uh, Paul says, will you address how to grade these activities? Actually, in the 27 videos for next week, one of them is on assessment and grading. And so you should, that's a 10-minute video. It explains how to grade and, and I, I, opportunities for grading. And if you're interested in more, I had a student do a dissertation on assessment. And I can share with you her papers and findings about assessment. Ruth says, well, we had Ruth already. Um, Diane said, <laughs> how could I use the bingo idea in an asynchronous course? You might be able to use the bingo idea by post by instead using a crossword puzzle activity and having people fill in online crossword puzzles. That might work. Bob, thanks for joining us. You must go now. Um, in terms of bingo, you could pre-select and draw out bingo. I mean, you could, you could go through and draw and then list the questions and have students complete the questions. You can draw out the questions ahead of time and see who fills in the answers and answers the most questions in the, the top 10, the top 20. There's ways to spin it out into an asynchronous activity and, and pre-select or pre-draw 
right? Uh, Shreya says, "How? Um, no, we did that one already. Uh, do we have more questions coming in from people? Uh, Paul Bodin, Bodun says, do you expense your, how do you expense, expense your props? Uh, I go to trainingshare.com and then I, yeah, I, I actually do write these off. I mean, these are the tax, this, is a tax, this smiley face is a tax deduction here in the U.S., believe it or not. Everything, the bendy guy, he's a tax deduction. Everything's a tax deduction. Even the, the train whistle, that's all, it's all tax deductible. This is kind of a cool little thing. If you don't want to get interrupted, you can get this police tape that says, I, learning is in, learning's in progress, and put that on your door so no one disturbs you. Do you have resources for ADA compliance? Well, Kim and one of my students, Anjali, just did a final paper on universal design for learning, and I think Kim would be happy to share some of the things about ADA compliance. It is not one of the 27 videos that I did, although I've done research on special needs online, including people with dys um, dyslexia and people who uh, have visual impairments and hearing dis impairments, but that's old research project, and so my stuff is dated that I did on, on ADA compliance, so I'll defer to others. Uh, I would love to have a copy of the ADA work, Kim. So there you go. There's a way to share her final projects. Again, going back to final projects and why they're important. Other questions? Here's a big question coming in, a humongous. And we got two books to give away here, and this might be one of them. Joe says, oh, and I missed Joe's question, so she's not going to win it. <laughs> Just kidding, Joe. If someone could write down, how do I keep the momentum of online activities if they're not tied to assessment in the course? It's not about education, such as Marine. Um, or medical biology. What I say, <clears throat> in terms of collaborative activities, make them worth a small amount of points. You don't have to have them worth 100 points or half the class. Students will go to work for 10 points, 5 points, 15 points for a collaborative activity if you recycle back through and reuse it even better. It doesn't have to be the, the bulk of the course activities for them to get engaged in it. Uh, Kim's favorite question, this is a person who's going to win a book. Justin has not given me a favorite question yet, so you still have a chance to win. Kim's favorite question is this, and this person would like to get this book. And the question is, Paul's question about assessment, he predicted the next session, so Paul wins a book for predicting the Thank you, Paul. So, Paul, send me your address on, uh, and there's a lot of Pauls here. Which Paul is this one? Pope Paul? Um, <laughs> Peter, Paul, and Mary? Uh, yeah. Okay, so, Paul, send me your address on the email. J um, Justin, do you have any questions? Anybody's going to win a book, Justin? They're going to get my, 20, um, my 100 activities book, so we're still waiting to hear from Justin. Someone type your, I love bubbles idea, or Tasha. Sorry, that's not a question. I can't give you a book for that. <laughs> Patty Moran is with us here. Paul Carson is with us. <clears throat> what are the larger implications for librarians who teach live or online? You know, I think librarians are going to have to become leaders of redesign of classroom space, number one. I think librarians are going to have to showcase how to utilize some of the software like screencasting software where you can talk people through websites. I think the, the um, librarians should be showcasing small snippets of how we can all change and, and flagging what's happening on the campus to create best practice websites. So I think librarians should be thinking about open educational resources and digital books and how they might transform education. Cyberians, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I think that finding free content, indexing it for others on your campus, and then having institutes, having one-day sessions where you showcase what's happening across your entire campus, it could start in the library and percolate out throughout your whole place. Um, Justin's got a question, and that this person's going to win a book, my 100 Activities book for somebody. 
send me an address. This question is from S-U-K-A-I-N-A-W, Sukiana. At what point in an activity do you abandon it if it's not working, or should you complete it anyways? Well, there's a couple questions in there. One is, if something doesn't, that's you, yes, that's you, send me an email. The question just came up, Kim, could you write that down for me? Um, first of all, if something doesn't work once, don't give up on it. Try it again. If something's not working and you're in the middle of using it, tell your students, hey, this is not working as well as I hoped. Here are some opportunities to change it. Let's vote on maybe changing the structure of this. I lean towards option one or two. Here are three other options. What would you like to do? That would be a some way to go. Awesome librarian tips, <clears throat> technology training, free content, paid resources, small sessions, campus connections, and better ways of learning. How do people keep their eyes in shape when online for so long during the day? Some people put their, their MOOC classes on like I did last week, and that might help. I don't know. So um, how do we keep their eye? I'm, you, my chiropractor says I need to go look outside every 15, 20 minutes, not only for my eyes, but for my back. So I guess that's one thing. I think it's a, it's a serious question here. Allocate time. Look up, look up. No, allocate. Tell your students, you, I'll be online on Fridays or Saturdays. I know in Saudi Arabia, Thursdays and Fridays are religious holy days. They're not online those days. In, in, in Dubai, it's Fridays and Saturdays are the weekend. In the North America and Australia, it's Saturdays and Sundays. So I tell my students, I'm online Monday night and Saturday morning and one other day during the week I decide on. So don't expect me there 24 hours a day, although Kim knows I'm pretty much online 24 hours a day. Um, what advice do you have for helping on Ed says, what advice do you have? Is this Ed, Ed Frick? Correct. Oh, Ed, Ed Gret. OK. All right, thank you, Ed, for, for joining us in here today. Let's look for Ed on the web here. Where are you, Ed? Ed Ger oh, Ed from University of Illinois Champaign. Thank you, Ed. Ed is about to retire, and um, he's up there in Chicago. And he says, what advice do you have for helping campus at large seriously think about authentic assessments and better ways of assessing student learning? Well, first of all, I think you need to have enough people showcased on your campus that you're getting attention on your campus from Educause. Where, or not Educause, but some other way where your uh, instructors are getting awards at conferences for innovative teaching for their authentic activities. And when you have the president recognize that your instructors are being showcased in an article in Educause Quarterly or Educause Review, or they're doing a summit at Educause Learning Initiatives here in the States, or in Eden in the UK, or Asolite in Australia, or eLearning Week in Korea, or whatever conference it is, as your instructors are being picked out as doing something innovative, that needs to be forwarded into the deans, to the presidents, to the school principals, to the State Department heads, so that they are aware of, the, of this, is, this is a trend that's being recognized around the world. Recognitions do help create momentum, because when someone's recognized, I lost my camera. <laughs> we'll bring you back. <laughs> I keep flipping off this camera. <laughs> OK. When your people are recognized with an award, with some kind of recognition, I now have to put my book back underneath this, I think, um, you'll, you'll get the press, the media, wrapped around it. When that happens, you're going to get buy-in. So that's one idea. Second idea to accept um, authentic tasks is to get Tom Reeves' book, Authentic learning. Tom Reeves, Jan Harrington from Perth at is she at Murdoch University, Dorrit, and um, um, Ron Oliver from Edith Cohen. They have a book called Authentic E-Learning. <clears throat> I had a chance to read it and endorse it, and that book summarizes why we need authentic learning. Get 20 copies for your, all your administrators. That's my second idea about how to get buy-in. 
My third, I, and, and have a discussion forum, ha, maybe have a book club around authentic e-learning and bring Tom Reeves from Georgia, bring Ron Oliver from Australia, bring Jen Harrington from Australia, bring them in. Hey, Gary Bender's with us. Hey, Gary. And bring them in and have a discussion. And if you highlight it and, and invite your president in, invite your deans in and say, we have three famous authors from, ar from around the world coming in to talk about their book about e-learning. Jim King says, how does your college get interdepartment collaboration? Uh, with online courses, how, how does my college get inter-department <coughs> collaboration? We have a lot of lone rangers here, Jim, that, like myself, that do that just decide to do things, and we have authority to do it. That's that's one way. We also have a eight-part campus where we share what's happening across our campus settings, and so we have a conference where we share what's going on. Um, but going back to to, um, to Ed's question, so that's two. So that's two ways: a book club around that book. A third way you might get buy-in from your president's office might be to have um, a, a best practice website of authentic learning. A fourth way is to have the research report my student did, who was at Northwestern for last year. She's no longer at Northwestern. Who looked at authentic learning and came and came up with best practices for authentic assessment. Uh, of e-learning. Um, those are a few things. I'll, I could have more, but I should go to other questions. More questions. Major Tom says, do you have plans? And we're almost at 6 o'clock. I know Sarah has to pick up her kids here. So Sarah's left. OK, so we have time maybe for a few more questions. Do you have plans to write a book about transitions from face-to-face -to, -face to online teaching? Not at this time. Do we need one? I, sure. I think we, we need a book about transitioning people from traditional forms of teaching to face-to-face. -to -face. And maybe Diane or Sharon um, or George or Gary are going to write that book. Or Fossil? Did I see someone type in as Fossil? <coughs> Fossil Medic. Thank you, Fossil Medic number five. George Station number two. <laughs> you must have been kicked out of here a few times. Dan will write it. There we go. Dan's going to write that book, Major Tom. Major Tom sent me a video message this week that um, has, a, has a, a song in it from a Swedish band. And the Swedish band's song is called You Learn. And uh, the band, is it Tanika? Is it Tanika? Tanaka? Um, that, that YouTube video of the song um, doesn't play here in the States, but you could still type it in the chat window. It will play in the UK. It might play in the States eventually. It's a song called You Learn. It might be the theme song for the MOOC. <coughs> co-author. question was about co-author. Did someone get that? Wow, who's on as a co-author? Now it's, it's being recorded. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Mustafa. Any other questions coming in? I'm assuming people got something from today, but you're tired at this point. I'm going to assume that most people are tired. And um, you know, <laughs> let's do this. Um, uh, let's do a yes, no question, Avis. Yes, we should keep going. No, we should call it quits. We've gotten enough here. We have to drive back to Chicago. So yes, no here. Go ahead and fill in there. Yes, we should keep going. No, we should call it quits. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I got the answer to that question coming up here in a second. Linda Terrell is working on a paper that she wants to have um, published. She sent me a note about it earlier today. I have to sleep soon in Sweden. It's getting late in Belgium for Alex. It's getting late for Major Tom in Sweden. Mark, I don't know if Mark's still with us from Dubai or not. He's not. Mihong, Mihong from Korea. What time is it in Korea? In Korea. Go Reds. Be the Reds. What time is it in Korea? 7.03 AM. So she's been with us since 5 o'clock in the morning. Actually, she didn't go to bed last night. It's great to have her with us here. Thank you for holding out so long. So people say we should end for now. So let's say goodbye to everybody. Um, thanks for coming. It's been two hours with you. And we'll have Haviz. Um, Thank you, everyone, for, for being with us here. Thank you. Thank you very much.
It's been fun here in week three. We have one week left on video next week. I'll start about video, then we'll, we'll field your questions about the 27 videos that have been posted. Watch one or two of them, maybe three or four or, or half of one. But get in and, and, and see, you know, I mean, they're, they're talking head videos. They're not the, they're, they're free videos that you can use for training. So I at least want to have you see about video. There's other videos. There also is a website that I have on shared online video. And so if you go to my web resources website and you can go to a number of free, and this is, this is just my, I have a bunch of resources posted. In number 10 on that list is a listing of free video portals. So there's a lot of ways to embed video in your classes, and you can take a look at some of that. You can look at my class and how I use video in my class on learning theories. And so um, you can see how, if you teach a class in learning, anyone in psychology can use my list of videos and add to them, create your own. That's probably the last thing I should post in there. Of course, you're going to have the, um, and take a look at um, the um, the videos, the 27 videos from the Instructional Consulting Office at IU. And this is the Instructional Consulting Office at IU. We'll see some of you in New Orleans. Uh, let me know who's coming to New Orleans so I can say hi to you. Uh, and if you want to get my quicker YouTube channel videos, I can put that and we'll summarize this discussion and send that to everybody so that you have it. This is my 27 videos in YouTube, so a lot of stuff here. <clears throat> my voice is going, so I better say goodbye. Thanks again. You can stop the recording. I think at this point, thank you.